She was one of the most divisive women in history, like Cleopatra before her, or Marie Antoinette after her. And just like them, her influence and rise to power came crashing down, and her legacy twisted and torn. But was she really the conniving homewrecker we remember her as, or an intelligent woman who took a great risk with what few opportunities she had in life? Welcome back to Six Wives on Screen. This is episode two, part one, the history of Anne Boleyn. And never The dates of birth of the other six wives aren't as clear as Catherine of Aragon's. Anne Boleyn's has been debated several times to which we can't be sure if she was born in 1501 or 1507, which would make her either 24 or 18 when Henry VIII decided to pursue her. What we do know is that Anne was born at Blickling in Norfolk and spent her childhood with her sister Mary and her brother George at Hever Castle in Kent. Other children were born into the Boleyn family, but they did not live long enough to share in the glories and disgraces that the family would experience. The Boleyn family had a rich aristocratic lineage dating back to that of Edward I. Of the four English wives Henry took, Anne's lineage would be the strongest. In 1513, Anne was sent overseas to receive her education from Margaret of Austria, governor to the Habsburg Netherlands, who was likely a great influence influence to Anne as a woman in power who could govern with authority. Margaret cherished Anne's presence, calling her presentable and pleasant, considering her young age. When Henry VIII's sister, Mary Tudor the Elder, was married to King Louis XII of France, Anne was sent along with her sister to serve her as a maid of honour. When the brief marriage ended with the King's death, Anne stayed in France to serve the new Queen, Claude, while her sister and the widowed princess returned to England. Anne flourished at the French court, where she was exposed to literature, music, and religious philosophy which may not have been available or permitted in her home country. It is also likely that this is where Anne gained her ideals for humanism and religious reform, as she is likely to have met King Francis I's sister, Marguerite of Navarre. By the time Anne returned to England in 1521, she was commonly mistaken for French, wearing their fashions and speaking with a French accent that she had developed and kept throughout her life. It was common at this time for noble women to get their education and be married off as soon as possible. For Mary Boleyn, she had been quickly married after a brief stint as Francis I's mistress, but since Anne had not been a mistress, she had better marriage prospects. While her family wanted Anne to marry into the Irish Butler family, which would settle a dispute over the Earldom of Ormond, Anne was more interested in marrying Henry Percy, heir to the Earldom of Northumberland. The Butlers and the Boleyns quarrelled too much to settle while Cardinal Wolsey himself prevented Percy from marrying Anne. Regardless, Anne remained at the court as a lady-in-waiting to Catherine of Aragon, though it isn't known how the two got along before 1526. When Henry VIII began his pursuit is not clear, but it is likely he was trying to entice her to be his mistress as her sister had once been. Not wishing to lose her virtue, she refused, and Henry decided to propose marriage to her. So began the king's great matter. While Henry began seeking methods to annul his first marriage, Anne's influence rose at court, though she had to stay as Catherine's lady-in-waiting. In 1528, she fell ill with a sweating sickness and very nearly died. Somehow she managed to pull through when this illness would commonly kill people within hours. Henry was unable to attain an annulment from Rome, which removed Cardinal Wolsey from power. Anne, sympathetic to the idea of reform and had read smuggled Protestant books, was influential in convincing Henry to break from Rome and form the Church of England, making himself the head. Catherine of Aragon's influence diminished until she was banished from court. While Anne quickly became as powerful as a queen without the title, the common people hated her. She narrowly escaped a violent attack in 1531, as the place she was staying at was by the river and the king's bodyguards rowed her to safety. Henry made Anne Marquess of Pembroke in 1532, holding a title in her own right, in order to strengthen her legitimacy to the title of Queen. After a brief conference in Calais, where King Francis I gave his support for their marriage, Anne and Henry secretly married in November. In January, Anne found she was pregnant and the second ceremony was held. The death of the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Warham, led to Thomas Cramner taking his place. Cramner, an ally of Henry and Anne, declared the annulment of Henry's marriage to Catherine and legitimised Anne as Henry's wife and consort. Anne received a coronation at Westminster Abbey with all the splendour of a monarch ascending to the throne in their own right. By then, her pregnancy would have been on full show, where all the world could see that she was carrying the future heir to the throne. And on September 7th, 1533, Anne gave birth to a daughter instead of a son. She was healthy and survived infancy, but she was not a son. They named their daughter Elizabeth after their mothers, and gave her a splendid household at Hatfield House, where Catherine of Aragon's own daughter Mary was made to serve in the royal nursery. Anne would fall pregnant three more times, but each of them ended tragically. 
Bit by bit, Henry's affections for Anne waned. His desperation to be acknowledged as supreme authority in England began his transformation into the bloodthirsty tyrant we know him as today, who would make several martyrs, Protestant and Catholic including his own friends like Sir Thomas More and Cardinal John Fisher. Some accuse Anne of influencing these executions, but she wasn't the one who signed the death warrants, and Henry would soon show that he could manipulate the law as he wanted. Anne had a final miscarriage in January 1536, days after Catherine of Aragon's death. The cause was lightly stressed, as well as the startling news of Henry being in a severe jousting accident. She had also caught her own lady-in-waiting, Jane Seymour, in the arms of the king, and probably saw the writing on the wall, but there was little else she could do besides try again for another son. At the May Day joust, where Henry did not take part thanks to his injury, Anne likely realised something was very wrong when her husband abruptly left the festivities with a handful of his closest men, including Henry Norris, without saying goodbye. She would never see her husband again. In less than three weeks, Anne lost everything, including her head. She was arrested on 2nd May on charges of adultery with gentlemen of the court, Henry Norris, Francis Weston and William Brereton, along with a musician named Mark Smeaton. Other charges including treason and incest with her own brother George. Thomas Wyatt Sr., a poet who admired Anne, was also arrested, but he was released without charge. She was taken from Greenwich to the Tower of London. Upon arrival, she asked the constable, William Kingston, if she would be held in a dungeon. He replied that she would lodge in the royal apartments, apartments Henry had renovated three years earlier for Anne's coronation. It is believed she fell to her knees and wept. Anne's fate was sealed long before she came to trial. Thomas Cromwell orchestrated the whole thing, providing dates for when Anne was alleged to have committed adultery, when she was in entirely different places, pregnant or had recently given birth. Regardless, every judge declared her guilty, including Thomas Howard, her own uncle, and Henry Percy, her former beau. Instead of being burned at the stake, the common punishment for women guilty of treason, or having the traditional English block and axe beheading style, Henry sent for the executioner from Calais, who would remove Anne's head with a single stroke of a sword. Anne was scheduled to die on 18th May 1536, the day after her alleged lovers were beheaded on Tower Hill. But the executioner was late, and it was delayed until the next morning. Kingston reported that Anne was at peace with her impending demise. Master Kingston, I hear I shall not die before noon, and I am very sorry therefore, for I thought to be dead by this time and pass my pain. I heard say the executioner was very good, and I have only a little neck. Anne received her final confession from Thomas Cramner where she swore that she was innocent. Where he had once been her ally, he was now ordered to annul Anne and Henry's marriage on the grounds of Anne's sister Mary having been Henry's mistress, thus violating the same Bible verse Henry used to put Catherine of Aragon aside. Princess Elizabeth fell from the heir to the throne to another bastard daughter of the king, and did not sleep on the final night of her life. Instead, she spent her final hours in prayer and, as is believed, composed the poem, O Death, Rock Me Asleep. On 19th of May, 1536, Anne left the royal apartments and came to the north side of the White Tower, within the walls of the infamous fortress. A scaffold waited, as well as a crowd. Among them were familiar faces, including Thomas Cromwell, Henry Fitzroy, Charles Brandon, Thomas Howard and Thomas Audley, as well as other nobles, like Francis Bryan and Thomas Rottersley, along with other politicians and senior laymen in London. She delivered them a final speech where she did not confirm or deny her crimes, but she did not outright criticise the king. Speeches at executions frequently had to appeal kindly to the king, which would avoid any retribution that may fall upon her family. Good Christian people, I have not come here to preach a sermon. I have come hither to die, for according to the law and by the law I am judged to die, and therefore I will speak nothing against it. I am come hither to accuse no man, nor to speak of that whereof I am accused and condemned to die. But I pray God save the king, and send him long to reign over you, for a gentler, nor more merciful prince was there never. And to me he was ever a good, a gentle, and a sovereign lord. And if any person will meddle of my cause, I require them to judge the best. And thus I take my leave of the world, and of you all, and I heartily desire you all to pray for me. The lady serving Anne wept as she shed her headdress, mantle and jewellery. She paid the executioner £20, forgiving him for the bloody task he was about to commit. As she knelt, her lady spread out her skirts so she would fall with dignity. As she prayed, she looked behind herself frequently at the executioner. 
worried he would strike when she was not ready. The executioner called to his attendant to distract her, and Anne's head came off in a single blow. Both her eyes and lips moved for several moments, while the Tower of London's cannons fired to announce her death. Henry, who was at Whitehall, immediately left to visit Jane Seymour and arrange his marriage to her. Anne was buried at the chapel of St Peter at Vincula, close to where she died. Instead of a coffin, she was placed in an arrow chest and left in an unmarked grave. The story doesn't end there, however. Fans of Anne Boleyn like to say that she had the last laugh over Henry when Elizabeth ascended the throne 22 years later, rising through the dangers of the English court, surpassing a Protestant boy king, a bloody Catholic queen and a nine-day usurper. Elizabeth gave Anne immortality, despite never passing on her bloodline. Anne's grave was discovered in the 19th century, where she now has a commemorative plaque on the altar, alongside another unlucky wife of Henry VIII, Catherine Howard, and the Nine Days Queen, Lady Jane Grey. Every year on the anniversary of her death, an anonymous donor sends a basket of red roses to be laid upon her plaque. So guys, thank you for coming to the end of this video. I hope to get it out sooner, but I forgot how slow my editing software was. I'm gonna try and look for another one for my next episode. As you may have noticed, this is part one of my coverage of Anne Boleyn. I've decided to cut the entire Anne Boleyn project into five parts instead of spending months trying to compile the history, the rankings and the themes and everything else into one video like I did with Catherine of Aragon because that took a long time. <laughs> I wanted to get that out in October and it turned out to come out in December. But either way, I hope you still enjoyed it and please help me get a larger following by liking my videos so it will get recommended more and please subscribe and share and please save me from being swallowed up by the YouTube algorithm because I followed a lot of YouTubers in the past and I know very well how evil that algorithm can be and I'd rather not fall victim to it. Thank you.